Our Talking Church, well, I am excited today to be joined by Dr. Gil Ferguson. You are an associate professor of child development at the University of Minnesota, and I'm here to ask a question. It's kind of a pointed question because you work with children and talking about screen time and the big question is, are screens ruining our children? And so I'm, I know you have some research around that, but maybe you could help us out with that answer because people are wondering, are they ruining? You hear all sorts of opinions and would love to hear an expert opinion on this as you've done a lot of research related to this. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. The short answer, Pastor Logan, is no. But let's unpack what that means. Um, one thing is to just look at screen time but in addition to how much time kids are spending, it's what are they doing on there? What's the content? Who are they doing it with? You know, why? All of these things. And what is their developmental stage, their age? All those things make a difference. So I can share with you two um, recent large research studies. So these are meta-analyses that collate data from lots of different um, empirical studies globally and put them together to see what the data are telling us um, from the overall, overall combined results. So the first um, by Dr. Chow Lee, it's a 2020 paper um, looking at screen time, so the amount of time they're spending, um, how it's related to various physical outcomes for young children. So this um, meta-analysis included infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. And what they found was that excessive screen time, so um, using more than an hour to, a day, which is the World Health Organization standard, um, was related to um, unhealthy eating, obesity, overweight, some aggressive behavior, and then sleeping too little. And so for young children, we know it's there are these negative associations. But why? For us to understand it, we have to look at what are they missing when they're just on screens, especially if it's passive screen consumption, right? So they're missing out on time with parents and caregivers, right? So talking, you've got language development, social skills don't get to be developed if you're on screens. Um, also, they're not moving around, so they're not getting physical activity, and um, therefore you can see how it would be related to overweight. Now, when we look at older children, the next study by Dr. Sherry Madigan um, is also a 2020 study, another meta-analysis um, of global studies. This is for children up to 12 years old, um, had a little more nuance. And so what they found is that the quantity of screen time was related to um, language development. The more time on screens, um, the worse the language development. However, quality mattered in the opposite direction. So if it was educational programming or if parents were co-viewing, meaning watching the media, using the games with them, talking, enjoying the time together, those two things were related to um, better language development. So you see the nuance where quality actually seems to matter more than quantity, and I'd love for people listening to take that away. It's not just about the time. Yeah, and it's interesting. You talk about the, the factors in the young children that it's not necessarily the screens that are quote unquote ruining, it's what they're missing out on, right? right. It's the time that they're, they need to explore these other things. They need to learn how to communicate. I think a question that maybe people would be asking as they're listening to this, or maybe parents, well, what is quality media? How do you know the difference between something that is just filling time and something that actually is that quality? Because I'm sure every every parent and every children's worker, everyone who works with, with teenagers, youth, if they're a, a children's pastor, they say, well, we, we want to give quality or at right. least know what it is so that we can make sure that we're limiting the time of others and making sure that that's more. It's a great question. So there are a few ways to think about quality. One is are they learning something? So is it educational in one way or another? Are they building skills? These could be soft skills like social skills or emotional skills, but it could also be educational skills, academic skills. That's one aspect of quality. Um, another aspect of quality would be the absence of themes that are too mature or that are negative. So violent content, sexual content, explicit content, um, that you really want to limit those. Um, I think of an organization, Common Sense Media, where they actually um, review children's media, movies, shows, um, uh, books, and so on, and video games on several indices, and they will have violence, and they will have mature content. They'll also have educational. They'll also have um, diverse representations. And so there are many of these things that help you to assess quality. 
One thing that I'll say for this audience is what are the messages that are being given as it regards your values? Okay. Are 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 the messages that are coming through that media supporting the values that you want your your child to be learning as it regards faith or are they in opposition and how can you talk about that with your child to expose them to all the belief systems in the world to explain why we have the belief system that we have right right no it's it's very true and and when when you think about education are there things that come to mind of of okay he, obviously you mentioned the common sense media that you can look at but are there things that come to mind when you say, these are things that I would recommend for places that you could go um, or types of content. Obviously, in the church world, there's um, scriptural things like Bible app for kids and other things that we would encourage them. But from an actual educational standpoint, sometimes the church can do that, but they still need to learn it elsewhere as well. Absolutely. Um, PBS Kids um, is a great app. They have programming on television, but also they have apps and games, which is always going to be high quality in terms of focusing on social and emotional development um, and also the absence of those more mature features and violent content. And so that's always a great go-to. It's free, and therefore it's not going to um, cause anybody any hardship. And so I'd definitely recommend that. Now, you mentioned Bible apps, and that is a great way for kids to engage with the Bible and to learn some of those truths. And we'll talk in a little bit about the age recommendations. So even for an infant, you know, a Bible app is not going to benefit them in the same way that interacting with parents would or for a toddler. So we even keep the developmental recommendations in mind, even when we're thinking about Christian media. Well, what's so interesting to me is the, the irony of all of it is, that you're alluding to is it's actually not solving what many parents or many teachers or kids workers are trying to solve is they're almost trying to give the kid something that will occupy them so that they don't have to worry about them. And, and I don't think many times it's malicious intent, but it's again, can you watch this so that, so I don't have to worry about you, but that isn't what the research shows is actually beneficial for the children. Right. So I guess as I think about that, I think that the same can be true for adults as well. And, I, and I'd, I'd love to know maybe a Absolutely. parallel of what you see. I, la, last night, I, I went to a movie with my brother and uh, two of my cousins, right? We had time. We had conversation after the movie. We talked about it. We thought it was uh, a good movie. But that was very different than if I were to scroll on my phone on Instagram right. for, the, for three hours. I wouldn't have that level of interaction and engagement. Right. So can you talk about maybe things that you've seen? And I don't know if the research developed this or if it's just intuitive um, among you as, as a professor and researcher. How does the way adults utilize screens impact the way children utilize screens? Absolutely. There's a strong link. But I want to back up just a little bit yeah. to what you said. Um, caregivers have a lot to do. Parents have a lot to do. As a parent of young children, I know that to be true. And um, there's some real benefits of screens we should not overlook here. So entertainment is a valid um, thing to do. It's great to do it together for all the reasons we're talking about. So I don't want to throw shade on parents. Um, there are times when we have other things to do. In those times, choose high-quality programming that you've reviewed in advance and you've got your shows. I have some PBS shows that are good for that. Um, just make sure that you've, you've done that in advance. But you're absolutely right that our um, media use um, influences our children's. And so, yes, there is a link there. Um, so one way to think about it um, is modeling. And so our children see how much we have our phone in our hands. Um, and so they learn, oh, there's something really important about that device. I need to have one, so I need to be using it um, as much. Also, it kind of takes time away from interacting with them. And so if we are on our phones too much, we're not meeting their emotional needs and their social needs. And so they're actually going to manifest that in how they're behaving. And so it might actually lead to a cycle of bad behavior because they're trying to get our attention, which they should have in the first place. So I think both of those things could be going on, just the modeling, but also the sort of cycle mm -hmm. could start up. Right. One of the things that's has been talked about in the news is video games and the effect on children, particularly violent video games. Right. Um, but even all types, there's obviously stories. Some are, are less mature. Others are more mature. Um, is there anything in research that has any valid 
um, findings that have happened in those things? I mean, again, as maybe a youth pastor is listening and they say, oh, well, parents will come to me and say, what, right. do you do you let your kid play this game? And they go, well, I do, but you shouldn't. How, how has that been maybe, or what has been some of the research uncovered there that, of course, everyone needs to consider for themselves? But the thing about research is, you try to have it be as le- least biased as possible. And so I don't know if, if there's been things that have, you've seen in the child development research related to these things that maybe could resource those who are listening. Absolutely. Aggression is one of those areas that has been a long interest, actually, even starting from TV days, way before video games. Um, and there is some research um, of Albert Bandura, um, who had this research on Bobo dolls. And this is something that I've shared with uh, volunteers in River Valley Kids Ministry, um, where children came into this experiment and they got to see real adults um, sort of being violent towards uh, a doll, a blow-up doll that would kind of fall down and come back up. And they saw, you know, punches and various kinds of um, violent activities. And then the adult left the room and then they were kind of free to, to, to interact And what was noticed, and this was replicated over and over, is that children would then mimic what they had seen in terms of violent behaviors. Um, And so from those early studies coming forward, we know that there is this um, social learning effect of kind of modeling what you see, but also looking for what the consequences are. And if there are no consequences for bad behavior, including violence, then children will learn, oh, okay, this is good and I'm not going to get in trouble, so... I'll go ahead. Um, And so those are some of the early principles that we can apply today when we're thinking about what content is going to be positive for my children. What do I want them to be learning about the world? There is a debate in the literature um, still about violent video video games and those particular types. And there are people who are very strong, who have strong views on both sides. Um, Personally, I find the evidence regarding the negative effects to be more compelling, but I know that you could have another researcher who um, feels is on the other side. You know, even if there weren't, there wasn't research on it, for me, I think it comes down to what are the values that I want my child to be learning? Do I want them to be learning violence or do I want them to be learning about collaboration and kindness and compassion and justice? Do I want them to be learning about those kinds of kingdom principles? So that's where I'd prefer to spend the time. However, um, to get along with peers and for things that um, you can tolerate, if you're present and you do some of that co-viewing with them and you're teaching them media literacy, then that would be the best way in which to start engaging in that so that when they're hanging out with their friends and you're not there, they already know what your beliefs about are this and how they're to handle this and that they're not to go out and do those things. So I think it's doing all of those together. On one side, there's a kind of a math equation that you talk about a little bit that is is not perfect, one size fits all for everyone, but some guidelines that obviously the Association of Pediatrics, I think you Mm -hmm. said shared. On the other side of that, what are things that parents and children's workers can be looking for that are not not uh, quantitative, but more qualitative responses to say, right. this is something that maybe I'm seeing these children that are starting to be influenced by this in a negative way. Maybe it's a parent and you, and you say, you know, for some, they play a violent video game. It doesn't really affect uh, their behavior. Yeah. For others, they, they start to see that aggression. Maybe it's, um, again, explicit content that they're seeing that it's affecting how they are. Or maybe things that they're watching online to where they actually start changing and almost acting like a different person. They're maybe being more reserved. Again, I'm sharing a few examples that are just off the top of my head, but I don't know if there's things that you've seen in in just child development that where parents and those who work with children can be aware of that maybe it's time for us to have a conversation about this, or maybe it's time to review the amount. Because for some kids, maybe maybe even an hour is too much. For others, maybe it's, it's not affecting them as strongly. But are there Are there indicators that you can start to see in children or even in young adolescents that are things where us as adults, they should almost be yellow flags or even red flags for us that we should do something about it? I really appreciate your sensitivity to the individual development. And I think you're absolutely right that caregivers, parents, volunteers should pay attention. So get to know these children 
who are in your care if you're a volunteer. And if you're a parent, obviously, you know that. And so pay attention to how they behave after a session of media time. So let's say they've been playing games or they've been watching a show. Um, Afterwards, is there sort of addictive-like behavior where it's hard to put the screen down? Is there a tantrum that's happening afterwards? Um, Is there sneaking of the tablet or the phone to do more of it? Is there lying that's starting to happen in order to get more? Um, Emotionally, are you seeing a lot of anxiety? Um, So those would be things that would be out of the ordinary, and that would represent what we call problematic media use. This is the topic of interest of a soon-to-be Dr. Lauren Eels, who is a PhD student of mine who's finishing her dissertation. Um, I'm sorry, she's finishing her degree, although she finished her dissertation, and this was one of the things she focused on. So it's almost like an addictive-like Um, types of behaviors. But the truth is, you would kind of be looking for that with any kind of experience. Uh, When kids come home from any play date or any experience, you would notice if something is off with their behavior. If you see those kinds of things, that's when you'd probably, you'd want to talk with the child and you might want to seek support. But I think I can say that this is the exception, not the rule. Um, And so most children are not going to be having those responses. And so I don't think parents, all parents don't need to be concerned about that. But if you have a more sensitive child um, or because of an experience that they've recently had, you might want to shift their media content um, or provide them more support, more co-viewing around that. Um, For example, a child with separation anxieties, you might want to look at the media and the themes that are going to come up in their favorite show or a movie before you watch it together because it might not bother another child, but if there are a lot of themes of separation in that film, you're going to want to support the child through that emotionally and talking it through just so that they're not left in a state of anxiety. How much do you think preloading some of that, for lack of a better term, can help a child process. For example, like again, if they had a traumatic thing and you say, hey, there's going to be some violence in this show, there's going to be a movie versus not mentioning it and letting them deal with that. Because on one hand, that's a, that's a benefit, but in, in real life, you're not always going to have that warning. Mm-hmm. Is that a benefit to, to kids to, to have that? Or is there a, a certain point maybe that you'd recommend to where you say at some point, you know, I, I, I think that's attention of a lot of Christian parents too, is they say, I want to teach them what I believe before quote unquote, the world, you know, which is kind of a weird way to say it. But before the school district talks about it or before others that don't share my beliefs, I want to share this first. But then kind of the other side of that says, well, you don't want to shelter them either to where they're not receiving the things that the world is talking about. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. And um, I approach that through what we call media literacy. So You want um, to not shield and shelter and restrict everything because then they're not really living, right? And they're not actually prepared for when you're not there, um, just as you're saying. But rather, you want to give them the skills to understand the world while you're there to explain things and relate it back to your values and give them the space to talk it out so that they can take those skills forward. So in terms of how explicit you want to have the discussion before you watch the movie, that depends on the age of the child, again, and how much they can understand. So with a five-year-old, you might not do as much of that, right? You will be, you will want to be doing a lot of co-viewing in general, so you know what their understanding and what their tolerance is, and then you select media and watch it with them and talk about it. Um, With a 10-year-old, it would be much different. We can talk about this movie has these themes, and I actually recommend um, some websites and apps that help with that. Common Sense Media is an organization that you can um, use that will review all media, movies, shows, games, even books, um, for parents to understand what are the merits and what are the themes. And there are even questions that you can use to discuss. Um, And so I use that with um, my 10-year-old. We will look at the Common Sense Review and we'll talk about these things. We'll talk about why this. you're not quite ready for this uh, movie right now. 
um, or why not this game and why these ones? And this does have some violence. So what do you think about violence? Mm. And I'll hear what he's thinking about it to judge that he's ready, you know? And it's it's funny, my son will say, yes, I know there's going to be some violence. I'm not going to go out and do it. I've shown you, I've shown <laughs> you that. I've learned that already. Um, and I know it's not an appropriate response in these situations. And, you know, so we'll talk that through and then we'll enjoy the movie together. It, it sounds similar having a parent who works in child development than having a parent who's a pastor oh, as I well. See. It's a, yes, I know, dad. <laughs> I know that I'm not supposed to say those words or do those things, but I'm, I, I'm not going to do that. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Um, he's 10. And so I don't restrict everything because he's already heard these things, even right. some mature content. He goes to public school and that's an intentional choice. So he hears things from his friends. And so I get to explain those and we get to think about what does he think about it? You know, what does this say about women and respecting women? What does this say about these values when you hear these kinds of things? How do you want to respond when you hear somebody saying that? And, you know, he's telling me, he'll say, I, I don't know. And so we'll leave it there and then I come back. That's just part of parenting is mm -hmm. that you continue to have these bite-sized conversations. Yeah. We've talked a, a fair bit about media in general, drilling down a little bit into social media, which, right. which is different than all digital media. Are there, you, you talk about some of the addictive, addictive behaviors. I know there's been some research that is back and forth on whether or not likes or comments or shares, things like that, where you can actually see the numbers. I know Instagram, I think it was like a year and a half ago, came out with, hey, we're going to get rid of likes. And now they actually didn't get rid of it, but you can either have them available to be shown or you can not. And their kind of, their, their purpose was we don't want that to affect how you view the platform, whether something has, you know, 100 likes or 20 likes. But they didn't, they kind of went in halfway. They, they were like, it's up to you, you know, so they took it away at first. Have you seen in this, again, I know you're particularly working with, with children and adolescents, but even across the board, if there's research about social media to where it's still relatively new and there's always new platforms, but maybe talk about that, the how that's affecting kids. A right. lot of parents say, when should I give them access to Instagram? And I'm okay if they're on, on if they go on my account or I'm okay if, if they use my cell phone, are there any guidance or indicators? Of course, we know everyone's, they're raising their children. It's not us from a screen, but what would be some guidance related to social sure. media specifically? Sure. Um, so let's start with what we know about social media research. So you're right, there is some research about even the sensitivity of the brain towards likes and dislikes. For adolescents, it's a particular period where they're really engaged with peers. That's just the way God designed us. Um, becoming adults, there's that, just that period. And so the reward centers in the brain, there is some research that suggests it actually responds more to likes than adults would um, and then responds more to, you know, um, negative feedback on social media. Um, now, the age in adolescence also seems to matter in terms of how social media is related to mental health, like feeling depressed or anxious because of being on social media. And it, the gender also seems to matter. Um, and so in terms of gender for girls, that window of vulnerability seems to be a little bit um, younger. So 11 to 13, some research shows, and that's because they hit puberty earlier. So they're maturing early. And so the implications of social media stuff hits them. Whereas for boys, it's more 14 to 15 is that window of vulnerability in terms of the link between social media and their mental health. So that's one thing. But then at 19 years old, at the end of adolescence, when they're kind of leaving home and there's a lot of transition in life at that time, it also becomes another period of vulnerability. So kind of gender and age do matter, but overall, there aren't very strong associations between social media and well-being. It's still sort of inconclusive um, and weak, um, which is kind of a good thing because it means there's a lot of opportunity to support young people. Um, I think what you want to make sure is that they're, they're not living their whole lives on social media. Too much and too little are both problems, right? If your whole life is there, you're not responding to anyone, you have no real life relationships, that's an issue. But if you're totally disconnected and parents are banning all social media, that's also not great because 21st century teenagers need to be connected in real life and online. So it leads me back to media literacy in terms of what I'd recommend. So 
you want your your teenagers to understand what are positive aspects of friendships and relating? What are the kinds of things that build up your friendships? Um, what are positive behaviors? What are things that you shouldn't accept um, from people? What does discrimination, what is bullying? How to not be a part of that, but then also how to be, not be a bystander, how to be an upstander when you see these things happening. So I think all of those things that we'd have to talk about for face-to-face -face relating just now have to be applied. Mm -hmm. When thinking about the people who are listening, who m many of them, I would say almost all, have a very vested interest in children growing up to be functioning members of society, adding value to their churches, adding value to their community. Are there things in the research that you'd say, this is something that I I, I would love to share. Maybe it was on the topic that we discussed. Maybe it, we haven't discussed it yet, but I know there's Probably you could go a bunch of different routes, but I wanted to make sure if you felt, no, these are these are a couple of topics that I'd love to address before we ended because it we don't get to have this conversation with people every day, and having an expert on here is very helpful. Yeah, the one thing I would say is I'd love to say a little bit more about media literacy. I've yeah. mentioned that term. Yeah. What does it mean, and what would it mean to help your kids be media literate? Mm -hmm. See, my perspective is like we started out in the beginning. Media overload, information overload is a part of reality. It's always been since centuries ago. So that's not going away. So instead of trying to kind of um, shut that down, we just need to teach kids to decipher what's happening and to swim in the current, right, in a way that they can navigate. And so here are some of the questions that you can use when talking about any media. Commercials, Super Bowl just happened. Lots of commercials, lots of messages in those media to talk about. Um, you want to who made this media? Who made this game? Um, who made this commercial? Who made this show? Why did they make it, right? For marketing, that's really helpful when you look at a commercial. Um, they're trying to get your money. It's really important to get kids to understand when marketing is involved. What's missing in the messages coming through? Whether this is... A, kids media or, you know, a commercial. Um, how do I know it's true? So helping them to evaluate the source and whether it's reputable um, is also important, especially in, in this era of AI and, and misinformation through AI. How do they know that it's true? And so helping them with that. And then finally, who's going to benefit from this media? Right. ultimately who is and who might be harmed from this media. When we think about marginalization and inequity, sometimes there are real people harmed that you might not think about without interrogating that. Once you teach your kids and teenagers to ask these questions, they become much better consumers. Another one for believers could be, how do these messages align with what I believe, Right. Um, and so are there pieces of this that I want to hold on to and other pieces that I, that I don't? So let's engage as thinkers. Um, and it's, it's very compatible with kind of bringing our faith into, into who we are and into kind of how we are people in the world. Well, it, it's so in, impactful to ask these questions. And again, being a professional question asker. <laughs> Um, I, I found the importance of that, and I think that it's so often we see the media, um, at least the polarizing media. Not again, we're talking about not all media is bad media, but the the polarizing media is not asking us questions; they're telling us what to think. And I think yes. you, you see that with parents as well that are that are well meaning, but even as a pastor, kind of t putting on the pastor hat, you can't convince your children to follow Jesus. That's not going to yes. stick, right? Yeah. You you need to ask them. Well, what are you learning? What are you seeing what is what, exactly. what what has been your experience with the church and you see a lot of people that their faith was never their own it was their parents faith mm -hmm. and they just kind of put on the on Sundays or whatever whenever they put on their their church outfit and then they took it off and they went to school and they lived in in that how important do you think that is to ask the questions and then teach in the midst of those questions versus saying, hey, this is what we do as a member of our family, or this is what we do in response to that commercial, or we don't say that. Because that's, of course, teaching, but it's not self-discovery. And from yeah. my my view in, in ministry, a revelation and self-discovery is much more powerful in, in your life than someone else telling you. I'm sure the same is probably true in development as well. 
Absolutely. Um, you said it so well. Um, in this area of media, there's something called parental mediation. That basically means how do you as a parent help the child work through what they're seeing in media? And one approach is kind of, you know, the shut it down. And another is to kind of be there, doing it together, talking about it as it comes up. And the latter, that approach of being there, um, it's called, you know, instructive mediation. It's doing it in the moment, is much more effective in terms of developing this media literacy and helping the child develop in their savviness. Um, so I'm really glad to hear you say you talk about the ministry perspective because from the child development and media perspective, it's it's the same. Now, is there a place for stating your family values, um, you know, written out on a set of values or stating that? Yeah, I think so. But we have to realize that's not the end all and be all because that's not integrated into real life. And children can't apply abstract principles to real situations easily. Young children can't do it because they're not thinking abstractly until adolescence. But even with adolescence, there is there's so many things going on emotionally and with hormones um, that they're not easily going to be able to take that principle and apply it in that situation. And so as parents, as adults, as youth leaders, as volunteers, we get that opportunity, right? Because we're not dealing with all those hormones at the moment. So we can help them to apply those principles and process things um, in the moment. And that becomes a much richer in terms of learning opportunities. Yeah, I, I find that adults and myself included, I think we even assume other adults are much better at, at tying those things together. And I think that we need to be more clear and communicate, hey, this is how this works together. I think as a pastor, many pastors preaching say, look at here's the point in scripture. To us, it's intuitive because it's our whole life, right? Mm. We know the Bible. We know ministry. That's our, our, our job, right? But it still is helpful to say, look at how this connects. And then to ask people, I, th I think pastors could probably ask more questions in their sermons. They could ask more questions in their ministries because to me, sometimes those are the moments where if you don't have the answer to that question, you say, maybe I need to have the answer to that. And it starts that external process or maybe an internal process that says, of course, there are things that the Bible teaches that are true that we're not saying, well, what do you think? Was Jesus God or not? You know, It's right. like, we believe that. But there are other things to say, have you processed this that I think could be helpful, whether you're four years old or you know, 40 years old? I think you're right. And I think that's part of humility, right? That we don't always have the answers. We aren't perfect at doing this, whether you're a pastor or a parent. Um, and I think sometimes parents might be afraid, maybe pastors too, you tell me that they're not going to have the right answer. Right. And that they're going to look foolish or they're going to look unprepared. Um, but you know what happens? You just look human. If you can have that humility and engage in this discussion with your children, and it applies to discussion, discussing all kinds of difficult topics, um, violence, racism, uh, media. It's having that posture of humility. What are you thinking? How is this impacting you? And then, yes, some of those conversations don't tie up nicely. And that's just kind of life. That's why you keep the conversation running. You have a relationship um, and you're in it together. Um, children respect when adults are able to say that they're not sure, um, but that they will keep talking about it. Um, children can tell. Um, I have a colleague who uh, studies kind of cognitive development and children's trust. They can tell when adults are trying to be overly sure about things. Um, it doesn't actually build trust. And so they need to see a little bit of transparency right. and humility that we don't always get it right, but these are our values. And this is why we want to do things this way. And, um, I, you know, with me and with my family, when we get to those moments and things are tough and we need help, we pray. And so there are ways to integrate all these things together. Yeah, it's so true. And, and I think that the same is true for pastors. When, when there's humility and transparency and authenticity in the midst of how we're teaching our children, our youth, and the adults, it's, a, it's often a much more well-received because they say, because we're not God, right? We can point right. people to that to say, you, you mentioned it, you said, that shows your humanity. Right. because we are humans. Um, today, we're not going to be able to, to answer every question related to screens or resources um, or, or pointing people to all the answers. But what are some maybe resources that you could point people to? You, you mentioned some already in the podcast, but if people say, hey, I want to learn more, I want to lean into this, and maybe, maybe they are a children's worker, or maybe they're a parent that's struggling or say, I just want to do a better job, 
where would you point people to on what resources that they can have for themselves to help in improving in developing these children? Yes. My lab has actually created a top 10 sheet, which I'm going to give you so that you can link to this podcast. It just has the top 10 things we should know about children's media, and it links to some of those important websites. um, So that it'll be really easy for viewers and listeners. Yeah, we'll put it right in the episode description. That'd be awesome. And then the second place is commonsensemedia.org. Like I said, they do an excellent job reviewing the quality, uh, both the positives and the challenging aspects of of uh, video shows, um, video games, and books so that we can be equipped. It, it makes our job a lot easier if we can quickly be able to figure out, all right, what is the what is the age recommendation for this show and why, and how can I talk to my child about this? And um, they will talk about developmental recommendations. And um, for um, believers, just expand that a little bit to think about how does this align with my values. And so it's very compatible um, for for people of faith. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I know it's blessed many who've listened. I learned a lot today and uh, just excited for your research to continue to impact people as we raise up children. It's one of the, the amazing gifts that we have in this world that, I mean, you look at Jesus. He loves children so much. Yeah. And uh, it's our responsibility that we get to do that. And it's a privilege. And so thank you for sharing your insights with us today and uh, continued blessing on all the future research and teachings that you have and students that are coming out of uh, your work. I was going to say your ministry, but that's a pastor thing. Your, your work and your ministry that you do yeah. uh, at the university. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Talking Church on YouTube. If you like this podcast, would you like this video so more people can find it as well as leave a comment? We'd love to know what you liked about this episode, what was most meaningful to you, as well as other topics you'd love to see in the future. And of course, subscribe to this channel so you don't miss an episode. We have awesome episodes coming up. I also want to send you an invitation to River Valley Conference. It's July 8th and 9th, and we are in for an amazing treat because we have Sammy Rodriguez coming. If you never heard him preach, he is a preacher of all preachers. He's coming. We have Dr. Alan Tennyson coming back, who's going to share his theology wisdom. We have Johnson and Jenna from Elevation Church that are going to be leading worship. And uh, we're just so excited for all that's going to happen. Of course, Pastor Rob will be there. I'll be there. We'll have amazing breakout guests as well. So if you have not signed up, sign up for River Valley Conference. And uh, we hope to see you here in July. And we hope to see you next week on next week's Talking Church episode.